whether you've been out for a, a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a couple of years, I know this is really, really hard. I know this is really, really hard. And, and um, it's important to have some goals. It's important to grow your network. I think it's important to have accountability partners. And a lot of what you're doing here is providing one another an accountability partner, which I think is an important step uh, when you're trying to regroup and, and move forward. Uh, the economy gives you, gives you a little bit of a tailwind. This is a pretty good economic environment at the macro level, about 3.7% unemployment. But beneath that statistic, there are about 7 million people looking for a job today. About 7 million people looking for a job today. About 7.8 million posted jobs. But some of those jobs don't necessarily align with the skill sets that we're trying to, uh, that we're trying to market. So I want to talk a little bit about what I think are the critical elements for success in your new role, thinking positively that all of your self-marketing plans will pay off and you'll have a chance, like the individual who I just met this morning, is it Tom, mm -hmm. who's starting a new job, you said, uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, next week. So let me flip a couple of slides and see if this is going to work for us. This is what we're trying to do, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about the break-even point. Have you heard of the concept of the break-even point? That's where the onboarding process is over, and now you're expected to be a full contributor to that organization, whether it's making money, whether it's saving money, whether it's growing membership, if you're working in the association world, as I am, or retaining members, depending on what your role is, we want to do all we can to accelerate the break-even point. And a bunch of guys with 20-pound brains did a lot of research, and they came up with 3.2 months. 3.2 months is the average break-even point for a new hire to start adding value within the organization. And our objective, as we assimilate into a new role, is to do all we can to accelerate that break-even point. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit longer, particularly if there's technical training required, or maybe there's some shadowing required if you're picking up a territory, a marketing responsibility. Sometimes we can accelerate that break-even point and make it a little bit sooner, uh, depending on depending on our past uh, experience. On the slide, it looks like it's six point two. Well, I think uh, we're, our break-even point is right here at about 3.2 months, and now we're creating value. So they talk about the six-month point. They talk, they talk about the six-month point where you're a full up round. But I'm saying we're beginning to add value at about beginning to add value at about at about 3.2 months. And so, what's the critical factor? Uh, to be able to begin to add value just as quickly as we can. Good people might disagree. Uh, we all have experiences from our work environment, uh, but I think cultural fit. Cultural fit is very, very important to help accelerate our break-even point. As I think about the four jobs I've had since I left military service about 20 years ago, I felt very, very fortunate because in three of those four organizations, I had a person on the inside. I had a very deep connection with someone on the inside of each one of those organizations who could give me a little bit of forewarning, a little bit of forewarning about the customs, about the routine, about how they did business. That is such a very, very valuable asset as you move into a new organization if you have someone on the inside who can help assimilate uh, your onboard, uh, accelerate your onboarding process. But if you don't have anybody, if you don't have anybody that you know well inside that organization and you have to start to discern pieces of the culture on your own, what are some of the clues? What are some of the clues that might help you identify the best cultural fit? Well, I think cultural fit is not common education, common, common culture, or common career backgrounds. A lot of people might think that's culture, 
I don't think that quite gets to the values and the vision and the mission and the purpose of an organization. We don't necessarily want to work with a bunch of people who just like who look just like us. I think there's value in working with a broad cross section of people and building relationships uh, across the organization. I don't think it's necessarily working with a bunch of our buddies. We don't necessarily want to go to work every day with our close friends. That is maybe not necessarily the best environment, maybe not the best culture for you. I don't think it's all about beer fridge Fridays. I mean, that might be a nice perk, and you might enjoy beer fridge Fridays, but we think about the culture where we might be able to do some of our best work and reap the most long-term rewards, I think we have to look a little bit deeper. So as I think about culture, I think it's shared enthusiasm for mission and purpose. What's the mission of this organization? What's the purpose of this organization? You can probably discern that before you go through your first interviews with a good, with a good check out of the website. And you can look for outward manifestations that they really are living their culture and living their values. That gets to a very, very positive uh, workplace culture. A common approach to working together or individually. We just did a major remodel of our headquarters at the Military Officers Association, and we ended up uh, chopping up the floor plan a little bit to give everyone a private office because that's what the cohort really wanted. They abhorred hoteling, or whatever they call it, hotel, ho hoteling, I guess, is what I've heard it called, where you come in and grab a cubicle and do your job. They wanted some privacy. They wanted a chance for personalization. So this is one of these clues that you want to take a look at when they walk you around at some point during the interview process. Is there a common approach to working together or individually, depending upon your particular orientation? A common framework for making decisions and approaching risk. I think we should always have some questions loaded, right, whenever we go to an interview. The best interviews are what, probably 50-50? Maybe. Maybe it gets to be about 60-40 if you're working with a real task-oriented person who's got this list of 12 questions and they want to march through these 12 questions during a 30-minute meeting. But ideally, I think it's about a 50-50 exchange between the interviewer and, and the candidate. And we want, to we want to probe a little bit on how they make decisions and how they approach risk in this organization. An essential element, I think, of developing a good cultural fit and respectful treatment of one another respectful treatment of one another when you go into someone's office to have an interview conversation is it like this completely devoid of any personality as this conference room is or is there a degree of personalization do they have some pictures on the wall are there some family pictures there some sports pictures there can you get a little window into what values uh, that person might have and what might be the focus of their time and their life after work. So we're looking for signs of respectful treatment uh, for one another. And we're looking for a place where working is about a little bit more than just a paycheck. As you, as you evaluate alternatives and you think about what's next in 2020, I implore you not to be focused exclusively on the paycheck. I know we've all got cash flow issues. I've got some kids I'm helping with graduate school. I've got a BMW payment and other stuff. But, but consider that the place that pays you a little bit less in the short term might be the place where you will do your best work and maybe reap the most long-term rewards. So I think these are some of the important elements of a good of a good cultural fit have any of you had experiences positive or negative with culture in a previous employer and be willing to share please uh, if you could like uh, come to states as a new uh, immigrant i think uh, i was working in an association actually corporate council association it was like a couple of blocks from here and i had this culture issue like it took me more than three months to get that culture because like it's a working environment 
which is completely different where I walked before. So it would talk me like four to five months to get the culture of the place. And actually that put, in a, put me in a position which is like I was highlighted that I was late to get into the culture. It was not like uh, considered that I'm coming from a very different uh, culture and very different place. So it was interesting to see it here. Uh, and I left it because it, even it was paying for me a good money. But I left it because I didn't find it uh, kind of my job what I wanted to do. So I'm um, actually, I mean, seeing this is very interesting because most of it, like, specifically talking to me. Even though younger people in our workforce today have more of a propensity to change jobs at greater frequency than my generation or maybe the generation just behind me, if you're interviewing at a place, and you begin to learn that people tend to be kind of long tenured, that probably bodes well for the culture. People like the place. They feel like they're doing some good work. They're getting recognized and rewarded. A, a counterpoint? I'd be cautious about that assumption. Sometimes it means that the culture is extremely rigid, that there is less welcoming of new people, that the onboarding process and adapting to the culture could be very extended. Um, <coughs> I'd be cautious about that. It's an absolute. Good point. Good point. Continuing. The best book for success in your new role. Have you in, have you been introduced to the first 90 days by Michael Watkins? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the best book to guide you through that critical period as you're assimilating into a new role. It's about 200 pages. It's a really quick read. It's kind of focused on middle management and upper level management. But it's a very great review of all the essential things you have to do to assimilate into a new organization at any level. And I won't try to take Mr. Watkins' 200 pages and distill it down to one slide, but here I go, trying to give you <laughs> some of the best talking points from Mr. Watkins' book. Insensitivity to informal lines of authority. This can trip up so many people when you're not sensitive to informal lines of authority. I'm talking about the knucklehead at the front desk who can't remember anybody's name, who's some sort of intern on a work-study program. And this person also is on a golf scholarship to Virginia Tech. And what do they do every Sunday? They play golf with the CFO because the CFO is trying to get her handicap down. Mm. And what do they talk about when they're not talking about their short game? They're talking about people at work. So as you assimilate into a new role, be very, very sensitive to those informal lines of authority, which are everywhere but invisible to us. And it can be so, so frustrating. Something else about informal lines of authority. I worked in an organization a couple years ago where the, the, the regional director who was marching six people through for interviews in an afternoon purposely scheduled the people to arrive with a little bit of dead time where they would be sitting out in the lobby because she wanted to get a read on their personalities and their politeness from the receptionist, from the receptionist. And I saw the receptionist have a negative experience with two of these candidates. And the first thing that the regional director, her name was Catherine, the first thing that Catherine did after these six candidates had been interviewed was walk out to the front and ask Robin what she thought. So it's so important to treat everybody that, that you encounter during the interview process or during the build up to the interview with, with great courtesy and great respect. Uh, what did I tell my daughters when they were in the dating phase? Watch how they treat the wait staff. Watch how people treat the wait staff. That's one of the best. That's one of the best indicators of character that I know of is how people treat the powerless versus the powerful. Sensi insensitivity to informal lines of authority. Watch that. Failure to align with bosses' priorities during your interview process. When it's time for you to ask a few questions, you know, you ought to ask her what keeps her up at night. 
That's a great that's a great question from a candidate. What keeps you up at night? What are the what are the competitors that you're most concerned about? Why do we want to ask about competitors? Can you help me with this one? Why do we want to ask about competitors? You can go apply for a job there, right? You gotta put that company on your radar. You maybe want to apply for a job at that competitor, and if you get the job, you certainly want to keep those companies in the center of the bullseye in the center of the target for what's going to be top of mind for you as you think about how you're going to add value to that organization. Failure to align with boss's priorities. And I think it's pretty important to have a regular check-in with, with uh, the person that you directly report to to make sure that your priorities align with their priorities. Very, very important and something a senior person will really, really appreciate. Uh, not knowing the technology in a technology company. More and more, every company is a technology company because we're using so much technology to underpin our marketing plan. If I was listening to the business press last week and I think somebody from Lyft was being interviewed, a senior person from Lyft, and he said, we're a technology company. I'm thinking, no you're not, you're a taxi <laughs> company. <laughs> but so many organizations see themselves as technology companies, I think it's important for people at all level, all levels, and in all different sectors within a particular enterprise to make sure they understand the technology uh, that drives that company. Poor communication with peers, seniors, and subordinates. It's so important that the first time you sit down and talk to the CIO, if you're working in some different part of the organization, it's not when your website crashes and your hair's on fire. You need to build a relationship with the chief information officer long before, long before there's a crisis at work and you really need his or her help. Poor communication with peers, seniors, and subordinates. Some bosses just hate five minute drop-bys that grow into 45 minute gap fest at four o'clock in the afternoon. You've all worked for people like this. Some want frequent updates via text. Some want a weekly written summary of what you've been doing for the last week. I think it's so important when you're onboarding to make sure you understand how your boss likes to give and receive information and do your best to match that preferred style. Do your best to match that preferred style. Nurturing primary skills at the expense of essential skills. Sometimes people call the essential skills secondary skills. That might be the terminology that you've heard, but more and more I'm hearing HR professionals call them essential skills. What are those essential skills? Team building, collaboration, customer facing skills, communication skills, I remember once Lee Iacocca was addressing, see I really am as old as I look, I, I can talk about Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca, who resurrected the Chrysler Corporation, was talking to a group of junior executives and I happened to be in the room and Lee Iacocca says, I have no use for someone who doesn't have good people skills because this organization is all about people. People skills are just so very, very important. Don't nurture your primary skills, whether it's finance or IT or tax accounting, don't nurture your primary skills at the expense of those essential skills. Collaboration, communication, team building, working through ambiguity, uh, aligning people around a common objective with different, with different backgrounds. And remember, four to five generations in the workforce today and each one of them has preferred styles for transmitting and receiving information. Some of the greatest generation are hanging on because they really enjoy making a difference. Some of the boomers are still hanging on because our 401ks turned into 201ks <laughs> during the Great Recession. Uh, the Gen Xers are there and they're always irritated because the boomers aren't getting out of the way. The millennials got a trophy every time they showed up. And now we're just starting to see that the uh, Gen Zers, the Gen Zers come into the workplace in small numbers. And so I have a Gen Zer on my team. And she will not answer a text message. 
when she joined the team, I said, would you mind if we communicated via text? I promise I won't abuse it, but if I really need to find you with this flex time and remote working and all this other stuff we're doing, I, I appreciate having your, your, your cell phone number. Sure, here's the number. I send this woman a text once or twice a week at the most. Did you get the slides to the president? <laughs> That's the text. Did you? Good. It's always good morning. I always do a greeting, and everybody laughs at it. Good morning. Did you send the? Did you get the the, the graphics to the president? And I get crickets. I get crickets. It's so annoying. And then I'll talk to her later in the day, and I'll ask her, "Did you get my text?" Oh yeah, I got that done. No problem. She, I didn't specifically ask for a response. Okay, okay, I got it, I got it. I'll try to be more patient. Every generation that you're going to encounter in your next job is going to have a preferred work style, and we've got to do our best to try to match that individual's preferred style, no matter how much it might drive us crazy. So think about that. Any other, any other early pitfalls that some of you have observed that you might want to share with the group? Any other pitfalls that you've seen um, hinder someone's assimilation into a new organization? <coughs> Let's do a lightning round. Body language is so important. When you're in the interview process, and certainly when you're onboarding, really, really, really watch the body language. How's the eye contact? How's the eye contact? Do they come out from behind their desk to sit by the credenza and have a conversation with you? Are they multitasking or fidgeting or looking out the window? Or maybe the worst one I've ever seen, someone I was mentoring through the career transition process who had an interview at a company in this town whose name you would all recognize was a little bit aghast when the interviewer pulled out her manicure set and touched up her manicure because it was getting close to 11 o'clock and she had some place to be for lunch 30 minutes later. You've got to suspend judgment. You've got to be patient. You've got to tolerate multitasking and understand that, that uh, some people just don't have very good communication skills. Really, really, really watch the body language. It's so important. That's why phone interviews are such a challenge, right? Phone interviews are torture because there's no body language. So what's the best advice for a phone interview? Smile. <laughs> smile. Make it's sure they can hear your smile on the other side. It really <laughs> is effective at transmitting warmth and friendliness during a phone interview. And don't go on and on and on for more than a minute and a half without some kind of affirmation from the interviewer that this is interesting and they want to hear more. So be very, very careful about phone interviews. Yes, sir. Yes, and also on a phone interview, <coughs> scam because oh, yeah. your voice, your diaphragm will be stronger. It's all about your tone, how you're coming across. That's how you're being evaluated is your tone. And that smile is so important. And I've had other people tell me that for a phone interview, don't do it in your gym shorts right. and your bunny slippers. Right. Suit up. And Suit have up. shoes on. Wear shoes. <laughs> Seems I, really I did cool. a lot of recruiting after hours. When I took my tie off, I wasn't as effective as if I left my tie on. Yeah, a so lot of people it, it, tell me. That professional sense of who you are comes across, you know, yeah. when you're dressed A lot of people <clears throat> tell me they, they come across much more professionally when they suit up, yep. even if it's a phone interview. Yep. Great, great, great point. Great point. Um, precise communication. Ladies and gentlemen, you've really got to emphasize precise communication when you're onboarding in the new role and certainly doing the interview process. People always hear something else. What's it called? Confirmation bias. Where we look for little tidbits that reinforce our preconceived notion. Confirmation bias. And people will always look for information that aligns with their preconceived biases. So be very, very careful about imprecise language. I don't like 
I don't like encouraging people to have canned responses during an interview, but I do think if there's a problematic question that you're concerned about, like why did you leave your last role, pick that one, why did you leave your last role, I think it's really helpful to write out the talking points. Write out the talking points. I don't want you to read the talking points during the phone interview, but if you've taken the time to organize your thoughts and write a couple of talking points, I think you're much more likely to stay on point and not be like the annoying politician who's not answering the question that every one of us starts to eye roll on uh, after a couple of after a couple of those questions. Uh, do you? Do you? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question about that? Kind of. Yes. This. So the, this kind of context here, so be it an interview or be it a, a first conversation with an important person at your new job, if you've started, <clears throat> if you can see in the other person, some of, something's happened here, this conversation's not going well. Maybe it's because you did something. Do you have any quick uh, tips on how to, how to correct that? Because it is a first, it, it's either, it's an interview, so it's a it's an important and critical step, or it's a first conversation once you've been sure. hired. It's a first impression. Sure. You can sense something's gone awry. You have any quick tips sure. about how to arrest that or change it around? If if I if, if the if the person that I'm talking to walked into my office, if they walked into my office, I want to make sure that I'm stopping what I'm doing. I'm up from behind the desk. Unless it's a very comfortable relationship, I'm always going to stand up and I'm always going to come out from behind the desk, which I think are important elements in making someone feel comfortable. We want to try to foster a safe environment for honest dialogue. That's my goal, a safe environment for honest dialogue. And that means I'm stopping what I'm doing, I'm walking out from behind the desk, and I'm listening intensely. Now, if the situation is reversed, and I've walked into someone else's office, and I see that they're, and I sense that they're multitasking, they have other things on their mind, this is where, yeah. the eye contact is poor, the only thing I can think of is, perhaps I've caught you at a bad time, and it would be better to have this conversation later on. Can I schedule a time with you? That's the only way I can think to back out of it gracefully. Any other ideas on how you might back out of that situation uh, without damaging your uh, Well, your one th advice I have heard is on a job interview to ask, do you have any reservations about my ability to do the job? I think that's a fair question. I think that's a fair question. I would ask that question later, not sooner. I would ask it near the end of the discussion, not early in the discussion. Some, I had a, I had a colleague in the Navy who I've kept in touch with he has a little bit of an attitude. Sometimes military pilots have a little bit of an attitude. And he always ends the interview with, so, how'd I do? <laughs> that, that's a little bit in your face. And, and I'm not quite comfortable going there. But if, if you're a Tom Hanks type of an individual, Tom Hanks is on my mind because he's so likable and he was on TV last night receiving his Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, well, maybe Tom Hanks can't get away with it. I'm not sure Jim Carmen can get away with it. Well, what about mirroring what the other person is doing so that they can see that there's something wrong also? Would that, uh, is that risky? I think that's it, a little risky. It's kind of like I think that's a little risky. That's a little risky. I think that's a little risky. Let's do a couple more. Will you have a, what will you walk away? You know, the objective is to get a job. And now you've got an interview. And you want this to go well. But are there points where you might have to walk away? Maybe it's a price point. Maybe it's a responsibility issue. Maybe it's a, uh, the job doesn't appear to be what it was represented to be as you get deeper into the interview process. You probably do have to have a walk away point, but I would encourage you to suspend judgment. Every organization has knuckleheads. And sometimes these knuckleheads work their way into the interview process. And one bad, one bad experience out of eight interviews maybe that you have within this organization before an offer is presented 
doesn't make it a bad organization. It just means they've got a person on the team who's having a bad day or who has poor social skills. So if you do have a walk away point, you know, be careful about walk away points. If, if, if they cross, if, 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 a, if an essential element of what you're looking for is missing, I guess you have to walk away. But I would urge you to suspend judgment and be patient. Uh, end every meeting on a positive note. This was the most discourteous person who was multitasking, looking out the window, pounding on his iPhone, and I, I never want to see this individual again. <laughs> Remember what I said, every organization has knuckleheads, and you just might have gotten one with poor social skills. Try to end every meeting on a positive note. Some other factors, ladies and gentlemen, that are equally as important as money. Name some. Other Medical factors. insurance. I'm sorry? Medical insurance. Sure, insurance and fringe. Yeah, what else? Working at a place that aligns with my values. Perfect. Value alignment. Work-life balance. Work-life balance. Remote working. Maybe some schedule flexibility. Maybe a sense of mission and purpose. I implore you not to be boresighted on, on money. How many, of you, how many of you have read Good to Great by um, Jim Collins? and his posse of uh, graduate students who did this research on how organizations make the leap from good solid organizations to great best-in-class organizations and he identifies three qualities it's quiz see if I can get it <laughs> skills and experience passion and economic motivator skills and experience passion and economic motivator I submit that you're looking for an alignment of skills and experience passion and economic motivator in your next job. And I know economic motivator is a big deal, but try not to let it trump skills and experience and passion. Everything you say and do is being watched. We talked about that. Google, credit report and social media checks. I'm sure you talk about this in your sessions here, but you've got to clean up. You've got to clean up the social media. You've got to check your credit report. And I think all of you probably know that you never, ever, ever, ever disclose any sort of social security information or personally identifying information until you're deep in the interview process. Deep in the interview process, right? Everybody knows that. These timelines <coughs> always slip. <coughs> timelines always slip. I say to someone, uh, that we're interviewing this week that looks like a really solid candidate. I try to be as transparent as I can and I'll say we've got five people in the finals. Your package is very, very strong. I need some time to get the teams together to do the interviews for these other four candidates. I expect that you'll hear from me by the 1st of February. But these timelines always slip to the right. So you have to follow up. You have to follow up when they told you at that expected date. But don't be disappointed if the timelines are slipping to the right. These, these hiring processes take time, and they always slip to the right. Be patient. Verbal offers, they take you to lunch, and you don't order the ribs, right? Because you've been to 40 plus, and you know how this works. You're not gonna order the ribs. You're going to order a little salad because you're not there to eat. You're there to talk because this is an interview. And over lunch, they say, well, we'd love to bring you on board um, for uh, 125 Does that work for you? Can you start in two weeks? And you're thinking, yeah, that's working for me pretty good. <laughs> I think that sounds fine. Is it OK to, to maybe shake hands on a verbal offer? What do, you, what do you think about verbal offers that are extended in a very informal manner without all the trappings of an offer letter and all that? What do you think about verbal offers? I think it's okay to accept a verbal offer, but follow that up with, I assume that I'll be in receipt of an offer letter outlining the terms that you just discussed, and then I'll have 48 to 96 hours to consider that offer letter. So I think a verbal yes over, over a small salad, not the ribs, <laughs> is fine. And just reiterate that you expect to see an offer letter and have 48 to 96 hours to consider that letter um, before you give a final answer. 
A lot of people in career transition always want to talk about balancing multiple offers. Do you talk about this in your group, balancing multiple offers? In the perfect world, company A, company B, offer letter or offer letters arrive, and you can weigh and consider these two great choices. In the real world, the company that you're really interested in takes a little bit longer to get to an offer and you have a perfectly reasonable offer from company B, and you haven't heard from company A yet, what's the best strategy? What's the best strategy? There's no, there's no absolute here. In my experience, the best strategy is to circle back to company A and say, I'm in receipt of an offer uh, that is very competitive. It's a great feeling. Uh, I'm very interested in continuing in the process with your organization. I want to be respectful of your process. May you, may you tell me a little bit about the timeline that I can expect going forward as I try to evaluate where I want to go. And I think that's probably the best choice if you end up with a multiple offer situation, especially if the one that comes in first is not the preferred landing. Other comments? Other strategies you see work for multiple offers? Yes, sir. Well, I think you know the company has responsibility in all this as well. Um, when I was employment manager, I would um, ask candidates, especially those that I thought I'd be possibly making an offer to, if they had other opportunities, if they were interviewing. I would want to know what their employment search status was. Okay, so it was very important for the candidate to keep me informed so that I could process that offer. If uh, I processed it and the person had already accepted another offer, that was a total waste of time. The other thing is, when you are leaving an interview, you want to make sure that when um, that you have told the company that if they do make you an offer, you would be inclined to accept. When I was a headhunter, I would always tell my candidates when they left if they were really encouraged by the opportunity to ask the question, when do you want me to start? Now, of course, they wouldn't give a date on that, but the reason for that question was to let the company know that they should go forward, process an offer, the person would accept. That's a very important part in how companies decide who to make offers to. So I just want to throw that out. Good point. Yeah. Accept failure is part of the process. We're going to have some turndowns. We're going to have a great interview. It's going to go so well. And then crickets. And it's so, so frustrating. Have any of you ever written a turndown letter? A turndown I've done letter. an email that way. Because <laughs> they, they told me by email that they were. <laughs> so I emailed it back, thanking them for considering my applicant and some other things. Like so if you have the misfortune in 2020 of getting a no thank you, I would cons I would ask you to consider writing a turndown letter. I would do it via snail mail. It has a little bit more impact than an email. And you want to say four things, ladies and gentlemen, in your turndown letter. Thank you for the opportunity to interview and the courtesies that you extended to me. You're a great company doing great work. I hope you found the right candidate. A good company like yours needs good people, and I hope you found the right candidate. May I connect with you on LinkedIn and stay in touch as my job search continues? And lastly, please keep me top of mind for any future openings that may align well with my skills, education, passion, experience. And sometimes people don't show. Sometimes people don't show. Mm. Or sometimes people have a terrible first week and a company decides to cut the cord. And, <coughs> and so now you're left with this stack of resumes. And even if you weren't necessarily the first alternate, if you wrote a thankful, a thoughtful turndown letter, it can break a tie. It can break a tie in your favor. I've seen this happen twice. I know those are small data points because I've probably worked with about a thousand people over the years and as a career management consultant, but I've seen turn down letters work a couple of times. And I think it's very, very effective. What about a turn down meeting? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, this is kind of like, is it okay to ask maybe the reason why it's kind of 
I got this refusal. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't go there in correspondence because this is such a lawyered up society. Most HR people would scream if, if, if we were to discuss those kinds of questions in a correspondence with a candidate. But where you might get a peek is if there was one person in particular that you felt a strong connection with during your interview process. And if you were not successful, you might ask that person to lunch or coffee. You might ask that person to lunch or coffee, and you might be able to elicit some feedback if you asked general questions like, tell me about the successful candidate. Is there anything I could have done to present my candidacy better? Those kinds of non-threatening questions. I have written, I've, I've applied, let me think about this, I've applied for three stretch positions since I left the military almost 20 years ago. And when I say stretch position, I clearly was not exactly what they were looking for. But I was probably at 60% in climbing. And I decided to take a risk. So what happened? In, I, I didn't get any of those jobs, full stop. Didn't get any of those jobs. But I did expand my network. I did learn a lot about myself. I did learn to present myself better in front of senior audiences. And I made the final few twice. And then for one of those, I felt like I had a pretty strong connection with someone on the interview team. And I invited him to lunch. And he said yes. And I asked some non-threatening questions. And I got him to talk a little bit. Now, it turned out that he gave me advice that I decided to ignore. <laughs> Jim, why did you buy him lunch at the old Abbott Grill if you're going to ignore his advice? Well, he, he was encouraging me to stop doing what I was doing and find a position that was more focused on profit and loss because they weren't going to hire a CEO who didn't have more recent profit and loss experience, which I didn't have. And I just decided I wasn't going to walk away from what I was doing because I enjoyed it. But I appreciated his candor and it was a good session. So turn down letters always. Turn down meeting, maybe, if you feel a personal connection with someone you met uh, during the interview process. Excuse me. Um, how can you write a snail mail letter to someone in the federal government? Tough. Uh, you know, yeah. where I think they're still very yeah. suspicious of mail. Uh, would you fax it with a cover sheet, or what would you do? Well, that's a great question, and I hadn't thought about that. Uh, I worked, I, I was working on a Navy assignment 20 years ago with a civilian agency, and all the mail was scanned, but we still received it. It just took a while. I think maybe the harder challenge on a federal application would be getting a snail mail address because most people don't give out business cards. But maybe if your network is good, you, you could come up with an address. Well, you may know the address of the agency, right? And, and perhaps the presumably the title of the person who's interviewing you. But I just wonder if, if a snail mail letter would get through. I think they still get through. My association sends written correspondence to the Hill all the time. And it takes a while, but it gets through. It's x-rayed, and it yeah. gets through. A while means a month? No, two weeks. two weeks. I mean, which is ridiculous. Alexandria to Independence Avenue, two weeks. <laughs> but it, it gets through. Okay. It gets through. Intense listening. Intense listening. You really, really, really have to clear your mind of clutter. <laughs> clear your mind of clutter and focus intensely on what questions are being asked in that interview or what direction is being given during your onboarding process. Intense listening, I think, is very, very important. And I'm sure, where is my last bullet? My last bullet is coming off the bottom. The last bullet says minimum level of effort. Minimum level of effort, one contact a day. I'm sure you talk about that at 40-something. One contact a day. Most people in transition spend way too much time in front of job boards, in front of computers. That's a part of the process, but computers don't have jobs. People have jobs. 
and you're going to have to talk to a lot of people to accelerate this process. And my suggestion is one contact. Oh, there it is. I didn't hit it hard enough. Minimum <laughs> level of effort, one contact per day. One contact per day. Minimum. Minimum. Minimum, Minimum level of effort, one contact per day. I was invited to attend a gathering of association leadership a couple of weeks ago, and we had a, we sat through a panel with three executive recruiters from organizations in town that you can <coughs> recognize, and they share recent interview themes for all levels, not just necessarily senior levels. Question themes from all levels. They're looking for team building examples. When you go for your interviews, depending on the nature of the position, be thinking about team building examples. They're gonna ask you straight away, why do you want this job? And probably the right answer is, well, the starting salary looks pretty good. <laughs> or maybe it's, I don't know if I want this job. <laughs> That's um, part of why. And, and, the, and depending on the situation, I might go there, I might go there. Especially if I, if I felt a connection to the person. That's why we do interviews. Um, why do you want this job? Have an answer ready for that question. Why do you want this job? Uh, they want to hear some personal backstory. And they're falling back to the tell me about yourself question more, fre more frequently than you might imagine. And this one executive recruiter said so many people lose it on that softball question because they start out in high school and talk about all these non sequiturs that have no bearing on their ability to do this job. You've got to bring it back to your skills, experience, passion, and education in what, 30 seconds? I think maybe less. Maybe less. Please. For an interview, if two minutes, you know, explaining your successes and how it relates to uh, what the company is doing. But in, in networking, yes, we do this in our class. We practice the 30 second, tell me about yourself. Well, in the two so. minute, we, we do both. Yeah, but in the two minute for the, uh, for the more extended way to answer that question. But yes, that's a very important part of your job, sir. And it's ever changing. It's tell not etched in stone. Tell me something that's not in your resume. Well, I don't drink in the morning anymore. <laughs> <laughs> sense of humor here. Uh, they're asking that. Tell us something that's not in your resume. Now, now, I tend, I tend to value a personal connection, a personal connection. And I'm trying to make a personal connection during every interview or business situation. And I don't mind telling people about my three beautiful kids who are very, very successful in the adult world. And there's always a risk that you're having that conversation with someone who stood in front of the judge last week. They said 50-50, even Stephen, and half their stuff went out the door in a truck. And she doesn't want to hear about my family. But if they bring it up, if their office is full of kid pictures, or sports pictures, or fishing pictures, or camping pictures, or, or scenery, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there and I'm going to try to make a personal connection with these people because we tend to hire people we like. We tend to hire people we like. Have you talked about the four listening styles? The four listening styles? There are four listening styles. Everybody has a preferred listening style. Each one of you has a preferred listening style. Some of you are very data driven. You're looking to see if this knucklehead from the military association has any numbers to back up his talk, D uh, data. Structure, some of you are more interested in the form that the remarks take, that, that, ha that hangs together with a topic sentence and isn't filled with a bunch <coughs> of non sequiturs. Vision, some of you are really interested in the vision piece to see how what this person has done can lead us to where he, he or she might take us in the future. And what's the last listening style? The human element. Data, structure, vision, and the human element. A lot of people in interview situations want to make a personal connection with the candidate. But it's tricky. It's tricky. <coughs> but if I can find a couple clues in that office or in their words, I'm going to try as hard as I can to make a personal connection. These recruiters 
and their, and their uh, companies are looking for examples of quantifying your success in very precise terms. What did you do? How did you do it? And how did you deal with ambiguity in these work situations? What did you do? How did you do it? And how did you deal with ambiguity? And they said the most important qualities in a management hire or a more senior hire are optimism and vision. You need to be all about optimism and vision in all of your dealings with these organizations where you would like to land a job. Optimism, optimism and vision. So now you've landed the job and we're thinking about closing out the search. Remember to manage it right. You need to write a lot of thank you notes to all the individuals who helped you through this journey. Write a lot of thank you notes to all the people who helped you through the journey. Let them know where you landed. Share contact information. Keep in touch. Very, very important. Uh, let them know that you plan to keep in touch and then do it. Pick a couple of individuals after you land each week that you want to circle back to and keep in touch with. Organize your search records. I don't like to say this, but some of us are going to have to do this again in a couple years. So keep up your LinkedIn profile. Keep your search records archived so you can crank up a self-marketing plan if need be in the next couple years. And then you probably earn yourself a little bit of a break, a little chance to exhale as you get ready to start the next role. What questions or concerns do you have for me? I hope, yes sir, yes ma'am, I'm sorry. I have a comment I'd like to make. One of the uh, many of the most useful bits of information I've heard from my wonderful association with 40 plus is that 80% of the men who feel they are qualified for the jobs, 80, no, I'm sorry, I'm phrasing this, um, I'll start again. Eight, um, men tend to apply for 80% of the jobs for which they feel they're qualified for and have 80% of the particular skill sets. And women tend to apply only at a much lesser percentage of 60% of feeling like you have 60% of the qualifications for a particular position. Uh, so I, I offer that uh, and that was been extremely helpful for me to know because I started applying for 90% <laughs> and there was one job offer I got as a direct result of feeling like, uh, you know, I was uh, underqualifying my abilities. I, so think, I think having a lot of hooks in the water is really important. Get a lot of hooks in the water. And it doesn't have to be an 80 or 90% match. If you feel like you have a strong 60 to 70% <laughs> match, get, get, get applied. Personal, tailor the resume, tailor the resume, you know how to tailor the resume, write a good cover letter, and then try to find an internal connection, an internal connection who can champion your campaign. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to uh, confirm that. As an employment manager, I didn't like to hire people that had 100% of the skills. What was the, what were they going to be learning in the job? They would be gone in six months. Uh, you should always look for jobs where you're going to have a challenge. That's the most important thing. Um, about finding a new job. And of course, I would go to uh, job uh, fairs, and I think your organization sponsors a lot of job fairs that I went to, the MOA. <coughs> job fairs are a good place to go if, to, to talk with people, to find out what the companies are looking for, to practice your delivery, you know, who you are, what you're looking for, etc. So I would encourage people to do that. It's really about understanding who you are and what you're looking for. We do one big career fair every year. Uh, it's in the fall. This year, it's September 17th. 
we do it at the net. Uh, this year we're doing it at the American History Museum. We do it at a Smithsonian venue in the evening to try to get people off the couch. Here's a chance to come out to a nice local venue uh, for a very high quality event. We'll typically have about 100 employers. We'll have about 500 candidates. We'll sprinkle a couple of panels through the evening that we think might be useful uh, for, the, for the candidates that we're hosting. Uh, it's advertised as veterans and military spouses and military children. But you've met me. Uh, my group is responsible for planning it. It's Jim C, J I M C at MOA.org. J I M C at MOA.org. I have some business cards if you'd like one. If you see the advertisements for uh, our career fair, you can read about it at MOA.org slash, slash career events. M O A A dot O R G slash career events. Uh, we'd love to see you on September 17th. But everybody's going to be landed by September 17th. Well, yeah, we're we're right. March 31st, right? Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll have some new folks that come through by then. So. <laughs> Anything else? I'm a little bit over time. Yes, sir. So in the new position, I'll have four direct reports. Some of them are not at the same location. Some of them have been there a very long time. Uh, it's been quite a while since I have actually been in that position. I've hired the people where I've known them for a really long time. So going in a new organization where you don't know the report at all, how do you suggest building that rapport, whether it's remote or not remote? Try to get a face-to-face -face meeting. I mean, if they're on the West Coast, that's a little tough without a travel budget. But try your best to get a face-to-face -face meeting. Try to make sure expectations are clearly articulated. Try to have deliverables that are due to you at some set period of city. So that if people start to slip on those deliverables, you can provide some follow-up, some encouragement, some support. Um, uh, make sure that uh, you keep in touch. Maybe you initiate it, maybe they initiate it. I, what's, what's the minimum required? Once a week, I would think. Unless you're seeing their output regularly, I think once a week. So clear and precise communication. Try to get a face-to-face -face meeting. Really try to get to know them and, and their situation and what, makes, what motivates them. I guess I'm talking about empathy. Work on, work on, that's not to imply that you don't have it now, but work on connecting with your employees on as personal a level as they're willing to let you. Connect with the employees on a personal level and, and try to be very respectful and supportive of their situation. And I think they'll respond. Most people will respond in tenfold for that kind of a, uh, for that kind of support. Okay. Hope Thank that you. helps. Yeah. Yes, sir. If I'm asking someone for connection in an organization which I would like to join, um, so I should ask from the very beginning that I'm asking for information interview, or I just start with asking for connection. Well, it depends. I mean, my thought is actually for for this connection is to have more information on the organization. So I should just come out and say, okay, I would like to connect with you to have to have. Are we talking about LinkedIn? Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people who won't connect on LinkedIn with someone that they don't have some kind of a connection with. I am one of those. I do not connect with random people who send me a connection request. If you send me a note and say, we met at the 40-something meeting on January 6th, I will connect with all of you and do all I can to help you. Mm -hmm. But if you send me a random note <laughs> saying, I'd like to join your network on LinkedIn, not interested, not interested. Mm -hmm. And ladies and gentlemen, there are indications that foreign intelligence organizations are using LinkedIn mm -hmm. to get connected with companies that are of potential strategic value to them. So I'm not saying to shut off LinkedIn, but I'm saying I don't connect with people on LinkedIn that I haven't had some sort of a direct connection with, either at a seminar <coughs> like this, or at a conference, or maybe a work situation. So um, after, you, after you connect on LinkedIn, then I think the way to go is to try to get a face-to-face -face meeting. I, th I think a face-to-face -face meeting. Who, who doesn't have time for coffee? Lots Everybody. <laughs> but if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. If you don't ask, yeah. you don't get. So I'm going to ask. And I can't think of a time 
I've been out of the Navy now for 19 years. I can't think of a time where I turned down a, re a reasonable request from someone who wanted to connect with me, that <coughs> where there was a common thread. They're college alumni, alumni, grad school alumni, um, a common, a mutual friend, a mutual friend. I always try to get the yes, and most people will try to get the yes. Does that help? In, in the class, we teach to systematically get to the person you need and build the connection <coughs> so if you're if you're like going for the home run right away your strategy might need some refinement so we want you to again build the relationship no one is going to give you a recommendation that they meant you one day here today right but over time if they get to meet you and know you and understand what you're looking for understand the type of person you are and your your, your passions then they're much more likely to to work with you I mean what you're saying is absolutely true I don't just accept random requests it has to be some sort of connection I'm a little bit over time. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. I do have business cards. If you like one, please reach out. Good luck to all of you in your career transition. I wish all of you great success in 2020. Thank you.